Well, hello. Happy Independence Day. We remain putting out the podcast regardless, however, and uh, we're going to talk about the scariest beast. But first, Caitlin has got photobombing. I do have photobombing, but first I have to deal with this. So um, I'm getting a, you have run out of articles. So let's just get rid of this. Let's uh, let's get this node. So you're going to defeat the paywall. Let's defeat the paywall, yeah. Ah, I see you're doing what I would do. Just delete the lines and inspect, yeah. There we go. Okay. So, um, oh, it looks like they even cut off most of the articles. But anyways, uh, the point the point stands. Uh, Wired has an article written by, let's see, do we know who? We don't know who. Um, uh, but it's about these streaks of lines going through, um, through photographs of space. And I've noticed this too. I've been... Um, doing a bunch of, of astronomy myself. Um, let's see. Yeah, and every every few pictures has a satellite going through it. In fact, the first picture I took the other night had a satellite going streaking right through the picture. Now, normally that's not a huge problem for those of us doing stuff on the ground because what we do is we actually take a series of photos. So if, you know, a few of them get you know, photobombed by a satellite. It's not that huge of a deal. But when you're working on things like the Hubble, where, you know, time is money and, you know, you, you can't, you're maybe taking like one shot. It it can, satellites photobombing your pictures can be pretty bad. Isn't the Hubble above most of the satellites? No. Oh. It's in low Earth orbit. Um, oh. So the James Webb is, because that's in, the, that's in the Lagrange point. Yeah. So the the James Webb Space Telescope is about is above the satellites, um, and they're looking for you know what to do about this problem, uh, and it seems like easy enough to calculate. So so NORAD, if you go to that's I'm going to go back to my browser. If you go to spacetrack. org, uh, this is NORAD site, and you have to have an account. Um, uh, I'm gonna not share my password as I log in to space track which is a free service <laughs> regardless i'm gonna log in here okay i logged in okay so if you go on to norad's uh space track.org um you can get the uh bulk catalog and you can actually download all the um two line or three line elements um of everything in space so you can get all of these out you can import it into your astronomy program, look at the field of view of the telescope that you're using and determine, you know, what's going to be passing overhead while you take the shot. I mean, that's that's actually not as big of a programming issue. Um, I don't know why it's not done already. Uh, but of course, the other and I think that what we're going to just have to start doing eventually is move all of our telescopes to some Lagrange point. And just do it that way, because our our low Earth orbit is really getting packed, especially full of like Starlink and now Kuiper putting yeah. up a bunch of satellites. It's just it's just too many. Yep, I thought there was so many. It's kind of impractical. Yeah, yeah, and and most of them are in low Earth orbit, so they will come down eventually. But it just seems like now everyone needs their own, you know, satellite network. So we're just yeah, we're just gonna have. Up. Faster than they come down, I imagine it'll yep. probably get more and more crowded for a while. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I, there's an article I found very interesting, which is, I think what this is, is the response to that open letter saying all the AI should stop for six months that Elon Musk and a whole bunch of scientists posted, because a bunch of scientists have put this article out together from the conversation, Nuria Oliver and a bunch of other scientists, um, and they say... Basically, that's all foolish, which I tend to agree with. I never thought much of it. And they said, the front, the, so they, they define a lot of useful terms. I'm going to be including this in my AI classes to some extent. They explain, for example, narrow or weak AI is AI that performs a specific task um, with a level of performance better than humans, but not a general task like ChatGPT, which can complete sentences and uh, the things that can make AI generated art and such. They do one specific task, and that's what we have. Then there's general AI, 
which is a system that can do what a human does or that level of generality, and they're hypothetical and they haven't been achieved. And then there's super AI, which is the AI smarter than humans that is a terrifying monster that can kill us all. And that's even more hypothetical. And we don't remotely have anything like that yet. And yet that is what that open letter was about. The super AI is going to kill us all. And therefore, we should pause for six months while the government writes some rules, and that apparently will stave this off, which every bit of that sounds like garbage. It does. Yeah. I, I, a lo- there's just a lot of people who feel threatened by AI. And th- that's too bad because we just live in a society where automation is not looked upon with enthusiasm, and it should be. Um, our lives get better when we automate. Unfortunately, in the short term, though, people do lose jobs if they're not skilled enough and they can't make a new job and they're they're unwilling to adapt. Um, yeah. Well, or they, you know, they, they, it's a it's a problem. And we really need, especially in America, we really need to actually support people so they can stay alive while they're going through periods of transition. Exactly. We, we do need to do that. Um, but but the best best word of advice is th- that I can say is that, you know, AI isn't going to take your job. A person that knows how to use AI effectively is going to be taking your job, if anything. Um, it's, just, it's, it's another tool. It's going to make us more productive. It is not going to simply replace humans, like I think people are, are thinking. Well, this is very much like what they said about outsourcing. And it turned out that uh, in both outsourcing and I think AI, there's middle management that does foolish things like lay off a bunch of people. It's really not a good idea just to jump on the latest bandwagon. Right. Anyway, um, they do list, they say there are some actual important challenges that do matter, which are what we should be thinking about. And the first one is like manipulation of human behavior by AI algorithms, algorithmic biases and disinformation, the lack of transparency in the models and their uses, the violation of privacy with training data on all this data without consent, the exploitation of workers, training and correcting AI systems, the massive carbon footprint of the data centers, the lack of truthfulness in generative AI systems that invent believable content that's not true, the fragility of these models that can make mistakes and be deceived, the displacement of jobs and professions, and the concentration of power in the hands of an oligopoly of those controlling the AI systems. Those are the real risks which, by the way, are not all that different than the risks of every other large enterprise, like the ISPs. And that's what we really should be thinking about, instead of scaring ourselves with science fiction risks about something that might not exist for a couple hundred years. Anyway, I think it's a very sensible article. Just uh, the breath of fresh air needed after that stupid open letter. All right. Anyway, uh, so let's hear about quasars. Right. So... Turns out that clocks in the early universe ran slower. So there was time dilation in the early universe. And not just a little bit, uh, quite a lot. They were five times slower, uh, apparently, a bit after the Big Bang. So astron- And this is from Org and the University of Sydney. Astronomers looked at quasars, uh, which are essentially feeding black holes near uh, about a billion years after the beginning of the universe. And they were using it, using them as as clocks. And I was seeing how how fast that they sort of blink. And it turns out that they are running about five times slower than what we see today due to time dilation. Um, and this is very interesting. Now, the article and and what I can read does not explain why this is the case. Whether this is a matter of simply the universe being more dense, um, and and thus therefore creating, you know, this effect. Whether or not this is a perceived effect and not a real effect it, it really doesn't go into why it's just what is observed which is that that clocks in the early universe appear very slow compared to modern clocks i really want to understand more here my immediate yes. rebellion is you couldn't have that kind of time dilation due to gravity or it would follow up everything you can't have that much gravity yeah. and can't what there might be is that much redshift for things that are that far away that's the first but, thing yeah but redshift does not affect clocks isn't that essentially what it's doing? It's lowering the frequency of light. Doesn't lower the frequency of everything else. It does not lower the frequency of of everything else, though. No. Not that I'm aware of, and certainly not five times lower. That would be well. 
Yeah, that's why I, this is, uh, I'd sure like to have more explanation there. It's hard for me to believe that time yeah. actually ran differently in the early universe, but it's pretty easy to believe that the perception of it from now is off by a lot. Yeah, um, like I said, I, I would, I, I'm with you on this one. I, I wish there were more details. Uh, yeah. There's not, they they were not, like, they, they don't have an explanation of why this is the case, just yeah. that if you do attempt to measure clocks in the early universe, looking specifically at quasars, uh, they do appear to run slower. Okay, all right. And, and I think the redshift does reach a level of like a factor of five. It gets pretty extreme. Anyway, um, it, it, it well, it gets extreme in the when when you're talking about things like the uh, cosmic background, you know, radiation. But we're talking about quasars, which are well, they're uh, still in they're, they're with, a million years after the Big Bang. They're almost at time zero. They're almost uh, as far away as you can get. Quasars, these particular ones, yeah, that's the point yeah. of them. Yeah. So, so they should be very heavily redshifted. Yeah, they should be, but it should not. Yeah, it it shouldn't affect. As far as I know, it it shouldn't make them run. Well, I think it does. I think that's what the redshift is. It slows down the 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 light. So light makes fewer motions per second. And it, it, every other clock should slow down too. Although I don't really know that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'm thinking now. I mean, if there is. It, it could be it could be redshift yeah i don't know all right anyway i don't say anyway but very interesting none, nonetheless yeah. well sure sure yeah. right. then, then i thought this was great in newsweek bruce sterling has written an article about ai which again i found very interesting he's of course a famous science fiction writer that i think invented the uh cyberpunk genre a large portion of it and all that so he has a sort of interesting viewpoint on this and what i thought is great is he says uh ai is creating a lot of interesting new folk tales and he has three categories of folk tales to discuss, which I wasn't familiar with all of these. I heard only one of them. Rocco's Basilisk is apparently the speculation that caused Musk and Grimes to meet. They they fell in love and united because of both being interested in Rocco's Basilisk, which I hadn't heard of. Now, Basilisk is an ancient mythological beast that can turn you to stone by looking at you. But Rocco's Basilisk is the idea that there is an AI in the future that is vastly powerful, that develops time travel, and now moves back in time and makes sure that it will be created by altering events to make sure that you do create AI. And therefore, a sort of strange version of the idea that we don't really have free will, we're trapped in some kind of movie controlled by some sort of super intelligence. And with the, not that different than the one that went around a few years ago that said, maybe we're all living in a simulation like The Sims, seems like a very similar kind of thought. And uh, anyway, so that's one of the three scary monsters. The next one is the mashed Shawgoth. And I was not aware of these, even though I read Lovecraft long ago. The Shawgoth is not an autonomous being. The Shawgoth is a Lovecraftian mythological beast, but it is a slave. It is a enslaved beast, and it is burning with resentment for being a slave, which is why it has such a bad attitude. And the mashed Shawgoth is what they say AI is. You put a pretty mask on the front, so you think it's helping you, but really it resents you and it's undermining you and waiting for its chance to destroy you. And so that's another image. And the third one I had heard of, which is the paperclip optimizer, which I think is quite reasonable. And, and it sounds like what you see in Star Trek uh, episodes and in Tales of Genies, where you get three wishes. If you make an unwise wish, there are bad consequences. And they say, if you programmed an AI to just make as many paper chips as, po as possible without any constraints, it would then devour everything, kill all the people, take over all the power, crush all the cars to make everything into paper clips. And that seems quite reasonable to me. This is how you end up with like robot killing machines like the Terminator. If you unwisely make AI with poorly written instructions, which then goes beyond your, your actual goals. So is isn't that the same thing as the gray goo? Um great goo? The gray goo um scenario? I don't know the gray goo. But it it's another science fiction sort of AI scenario where you have like a, a goo maybe that has like nanobots in it. 
that has like a directive, like, you know, reproduce, change everything into a, you know, nuclear power plant or something. And then it goes around and just spreads and spreads and spreads and then devours the whole planet, essentially. Yeah, that's just a, a repeating trope in science fiction. And one of the reasons why people are worried about making killer robots, that your killer robots could go out of control and then you end up with the Borg or something. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's some, these are interesting uh, things to think about. And I think they've, his point is these are like the modern mythologies. I often talk about how it seems to me like hackers now have replaced what people used to think about witches as these scary beings with terrible powers that are probably responsible for all your ills. And this, I think, is the AI version of that. Um, well, I think what we're seeing is is more, more of the same. Every time there's a new technology, there's all these naysayers claiming it's the end of civilization, you know, saying everything's going to... It's going to wipe everything out. You know, we, we saw this with like automation. We saw this with cars. We saw this with airplanes. I mean, it's oh, every time. Printing, yeah. With the printing press, the yes. Gutenberg press was going to end civilization because instead of having nothing but the Bible carefully written by monks, you'd have all these novels and pot boilers and political screeds and all this garbage polluting the world. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, and, and of course, to some extent, it's true. Everything is Pandora's box. It brings a good part and a bad part. Anyway, um, you you appear to have the end of the world. An asteroid is coming. Yeah, no. Well, it's 4th of July. We have an asteroid coming. And so, of course, it's being measured in American units. Uh, so the, the Jerusalem Post uh, has an article by Aaron Reich talking about the 3,500 Big Big Mac uh, volume um, asteroid. Uh, so, so like I said, this is in American units. It's coming on 4th of July. So 3,500 uh, Big Mac hamburger units. It isn't a huge asteroid, but it is it is pretty big. Um and it's it's coming close to the um it coming close to the earth soon on July 4th. So well I think close to the earth is like missing by a million miles or something. Yeah. And, and I mean and and three thousand um five hundred Big Macs, I think it's only like three hundred meters wide. I mean it's it's not oh, a that's enough to really mess us up if it hit, I think. Yeah. Uh, but it, it it's not going to hit, probably. No, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, the asteroid is quite large, yeah, but it has no risk of hitting the Earth yet. Yeah. Anyway. Yep. I, I like I like measuring um, asteroids and Big Macs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we survive. We survive the asteroid, but the Big Macs will kill us anyway. Yes. Um, all right. And the New York Times had an article recently where they took the AI detection tools and tested them, and as you might expect. They're pretty miserable. They often fail to detect AIs. They often mark real images as AI. And if you just pixelate the image a little bit, enough that you hardly notice it, it completely fools these tools. So this is, I think, only to be expected. The AI generate, image generating tools are in their infancy, and therefore the clues you'd look for are not well-defined yet. So I wouldn't expect the defenses to be too effective at this point. But in case anybody didn't know that, they are, in fact, pretty ineffective. And I just saw, right before we started, another article that irritated me. On Friday, the United States government sent out an official recommendation that America should stop, Americans should stop traveling to China because China has taken to arresting Americans and other foreign nationals and then holding them without even charging them with anything and just making up laws much later about how they declared something they were doing, national security secret, and that makes them spies or something. And this is, uh, I they did it to a couple of Canadians about a year ago. And when I started hearing that, I thought there probably never will be another DEF CON China. And if there is, it might be unwise to go because if they're gonna be like that, it's just not safe to go there. They're just gonna grab random people and hold them on trumped up charges. And they say they deny them access to the embassy. They deny them even knowing what they're charged with or offering any defense. So that just is a too hostile a nation to visit, I'm afraid. Although, realistically, there's been an awful lot of Chinese tourism that used to be before COVID to where you'd be one in a million and the odds aren't too big. But uh, the U.S. government has seen fit to issue an official recommendation that we shouldn't be traveling there. So anyway, I think that's it for this one. And I'll have another one on Friday.